I'm Greg Halich. I'm an extension specialist at the University of Kentucky. I'm also a grass-finished beef farmer. I'm going to get a start out off this evening. So I guess number one, welcome to our uh, pasture-based finishing beef workshops. Tonight is the first of three nights that we're going to have, both 7 to 9 p.m. And um, I'll go over kind of very quickly each kind of each one of the topics at the end of, end of this presentation. Um, just some very quick housekeeping. So if you have questions, I was told to ask them in the Q&A feature. I think it will be at the bottom of, of your screen. And one of the other panelists can, can try to, if, if they know the answer or have a good answer for your question, I'll try to answer it right then. Um, but we will have hopefully around 10, 15 minutes at the very end of both presentations to kind of devote to questions. So we'll also answer questions then. If you want others to hear it, uh, that might be a good time to do that. Um, that said, I guess we'll get going here. And what I'm gonna to try to do, this is kind of introduction, what I'm doing here tonight. And, and what I'm gonna do, I'm, I'm just gonna kind of give a very quick background on, on how I got into grass finished beef production and then give a little bit of history, just enough for context, kind of the history of, of grass finishing in this country. Um, and then the bulk of the time, bulk of the presentation, I'm gonna talk about some grass finishing myths. Um, and before I get into those myths, I will say I had to cut out, I think the last four of those uh, for time's sake. I ended up spending a little bit more on this history. I hadn't really planned on it. I think that's important. So if we have time, we'll, we'll go through those last ones, but the, the more important ones will be at the beginning. So that said, um, I am supposed to mention just very quickly some of our sponsors. So the Southern Extension Risk Management Education um, Association, that is who basically sponsored, the, the main sponsor for these programs, and, and we got a grant from them to, to put these on. Originally, they were gonna be live. We're gonna um, hold these in, in three states, and, and obviously with COVID, um, we, we kept trying and we kept having to cancel it. We decided the only way we're going to get this done um, is do it online. The good news with that is we're hopefully reaching a lot, a lot more folks live online than we could obviously in three different states. So that's the good news. The bad news is um, I am not very well practiced with, with doing this type of, of presentation. I've done a few, but just from past experience, it doesn't quite compare just in terms of how smooth the presentations will. Obviously, we don't have as good interaction. And so I, I apologize for all that going into this. Uh, John Fike will, will tell more about the special offers, but we have, we have two special offers for you tonight, one from On Pasture and one from Stockman Grass Farmer. Just for time's sake, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna say anything here, but John will talk a little bit more about that uh, during his presentation. All right, so kind of getting into the, the main part of the presentation here. Um, in 2011, this was a question that I had. Can, can cattle be finished on pasture in Kentucky? And it was a question actually I had for the last couple of years and in, in fall 2011. So these were stocker cattle. So up to that point, I'd been raising stocker cattle on this farm. So kind of typical buying in the spring, selling in the fall. And that particular fall, and this was taken just a couple of weeks before the, the cattle were sold, uh, I think it was in November that year. But around this time, I finally, you know, kind of made the commitment that, yeah, let's, let's try finishing some cattle. So we kept five of the steers um, that we would have normally sold together. And in a couple of weeks from when I took this picture, we kept those over winter them, um, and with intention of finishing them that next year. So in June, we took two to the processor made the, you know, the typical beginner's mistake of, of harvesting those animals too early. They were probably around 22 months at that time. Uh, they had decent meat yields, but next to no marbling. So we, we learned from that mistake. Um, we backed off our harvest dates on the other three. We, we kind of postponed them into mid to late fall. And we had really good meat yields and we had really good marbling. Two out of the three end up grading low choice. Um, so that was enough to convince us that, yeah, there's something to this. Let's, let's keep trying it. And so we continued for, and, and every year we finished a few more steers. So what I'm showing here is a summary of the first five years, 2012, 2016, 45 steers. And you can see kind of average live weight and dressing weight, about 1230 live weight, 740, 740 pounds dressing weight. 
Um, so the, the answer to this question, can cattle be finished on pasture? And that didn't have to be Kentucky. It could be Virginia, West Virginia, uh, Tennessee, Oklahoma, et cetera. Answer is yeah, you, you definitely can. You, you just have to have the right type of management. Um, very, and just this is a quick summary, but, but really the, the main things that, that we found that you need is, is one is good forages, not the best forages in the world. The best forages will help, but as long as you have good forages, good cattle, uh, but then you really need excellent management of both those forages and the cattle and, and kind of, you know, use them in unison. And, and that is the key. The last thing, number four, that's probably more important than any of them, because you can do all the, the first three perfectly, but if you don't have number four in place, it, it's still not going to work out well. And, and that's, you've got to learn to be patient. And I'll explain more, more what I mean exactly by having patience later on. All right, so again, a quick history, just to give enough con giving context to what we'll be doing here uh, for the next three evenings for kind of history of cattle finishing in this country. So I'm gonna first start in Virginia. I did my graduate work at Virginia Tech, um, so I have a little bit of history there myself. Uh, and this was a book that was given to me, I think it was two years after I, I started working here to Kentucky, went back for a visit. Uh, it was a gift from Chip and Debbie Sneed in, in Craig County. Um, and this was a book that was put together by the, the Virginia Cattle Association. They commissioned it. Um, incredible book, gives history back to about 400 years in, in terms of cattle raising in, in Virginia. And there's a chapter in here called Fat Cattle Kingdom. It's basically the vote to grass finishing beef in, in Virginia. And so I'm going to show just a couple clips from that chapter here that I think will help giving context. So the first one is a picture from that chapter. And, and this is a really important picture because it basically is, is showing the end of an era. This was uh, in the mid 50, 1950s, I believe. And it's the last fat cattle cattle drive coming out of the mountains in Virginia and, and quite possibly the, the entire Eastern US and, and possibly the whole United States. Uh, up to the, or at, around this time period, probably the last 10 years before that, 10, 15 years, um, feedlots were becoming more prevalent, more every year, more and more cattle were being finished in feedlots. Probably at that time, there were a lot more smaller kind of farmer type feedlots rather than the big consolidated ones that we have now. But every year, fewer and fewer cattle were finished on pasture like in, in this picture. This was the last year, uh, 60 some years ago. And um, a lot of history was lost at, at this point. Um, a, a few things in the, the book itself, just two points I want to I want to show you here, and so we'll zoom in here. First is, and this would not have been true in the 1950s or, or probably even the 19th century, but in the 1700s, 1800s, these cattle were kind of routinely taken to 1,600 pounds and, and higher, in some cases over 2,000 pounds. And the, the main point I want to show here is not that we should necessarily be doing that now, uh, but that finished is a relative term. So in other words, on our farm, we like to take animals from 12 to 1300 pounds. We consider that generally finished, but that doesn't mean that animal has stopped growing. If we kept them another year, we, we might be in that 1600 pound range. So that's kind of point number one. Point number two is when they interviewed the remaining farmers that, that kind of were still holdovers from that time period, um, and they were probably very young in the 1950s, but they all said one thing that, that you really needed to have to, do, to, do, to be successful in grass finishing cattle. And that was, you had to have good bluegrass based pastures. Um, so we will talk more about that, or John will talk a little bit about that in the forage section. I'll talk a little bit about, about that in the uh, Thursday evening. So where were these finishing regions? So East Mississippi, Virginia was one. Tennessee was another important one. Probably the mountainous areas of Tennessee, I'm guessing for that. And then, and then where I'm at right now, Kentucky. And, and most of that was kind of what's called the bluegrass region of Kentucky that, that surrounds Lexington, limestone-based area. What did all three of these states have in common at that time? They all relied on bluegrass pastures to finish those cattle. What about the Western regions? So most people probably think of the Flint Hills in Kansas. That's probably our most historical finishing area. Um, I saw some in here is, is from Oklahoma. I had no idea that, that, but apparently the Osage country, which to my understanding is just south of the Flint Hills in Oklahoma, was another important finishing area for grass finished cattle. 
Sand Hill region in Nebraska and, and many other other or many other places in the Great Plains um, they were using for finishing cattle. Basically the Great Plains uh, were the buck, you know, were the largest concentrations of both buffalo were it turned out those areas were also great for finishing cattle and that only makes sense. Uh, and the last place that I did not know about was what is what was called Mineral Point area of Wisconsin. And I had to look this one up. Uh, it's it's towards the southwest corner of the state, not quite in the very corner, but I think it's also what I what I've seen and, and referred to as a driftless area of Wisconsin, area that was non-glaciated that also goes into part of Iowa and part of Minnesota. So the point I'm getting to here is, is that we finished cattle all over this country. We did it, you know, 60 some years ago, not as much then as, as 100 years ago, but at one time this, you know, we knew how to do this. We did this all over the country. And going back to this picture here, this was the end of that era. Uh, we, unfortunately, we lost a lot of collective information in terms of how to finish, finish cattle well on grass at that time. And my guess is that's, that's one of the main reasons a lot of us are here tonight is, is to kind of relearn what we forgot from that era. So anyway, that's just kind of a little bit of history to, to lead us into the rest of, of what we're gonna do in the next three nights. So this is an important question because it's a relative question. So what do I mean when I say cattle are finished? So again, it, it could mean something a little bit different to every person. So to me, what I mean when I say that is, is that the bulk of your cattle are either gonna be high select marbling grade or low choice marbling grade. So it doesn't have to be 100%, but the majority of your cattle are gonna uh, be in, that, in those ranges and, and maybe even hopefully a, a few in, in the middle, mid choice area. Now, at some point, someone asked me to, not for this presentation, but for another one, to, to show some pictures of, of cattle in various finishing states. And from my experience, it is really hard to do. Uh, the lens size of the camera, the angle that you're taking, the distance from the cattle, et cetera, it all has an impact of how well finished they look and with, with the same animal. So I found generally it's, it's hard to do, but this is one picture I have that I think does a fairly good job. Uh, these are all steers from the same farm that we got them from as calves, and they're about a week or two ready for, away from harvest. This was um, mid-September a few years ago when we had a, a, a mild drought late summer, um, and all these cattle graded low choice. So just to give you your eye an idea of, of what low choice kind of looks like on the hoof. Again, with a caveat that it is hard to really see it with pictures. You really have to kind of see it in person to get a good feel for it. This table is, is one for those of you that registered early and got a packet mailed out to you. In the producer's guide to grass finishing beef, this is one of the tables that we have in that guide. For the rest of you, you, you will have an online link to this publication and it will be in there. What we try to do with this table, uh, based on some data that we had, is essentially calibrate it so we could give you an estimate of, of what weights you'd have to take both steers and heifers um, to from various frame sizes to, to reach about a quarter inch of back fat. Now, there's not a perfect correlation, but generally about a quarter inch of back fat will, will generally put you in that high select marbling range. Again, not perfect, but in general, that's about what I would expect. So for steers, um, you know, from 1,000 to 1,300 pounds for, for kind of typical frame sizes, or, and I might say typical frame size in Kentucky is probably, whoops, is, is more of that five to six score range. Uh, so for that size animal, we're talking about 1,200 to 1,300 pounds, and that would, again, be high select, low choice. We could probably add about 40 to 50 pounds to that. So we're talking about pretty big animals here that we're trying to finish um, in terms of typical sized animals. Heifers will generally be about 100 pounds less, give or take a little bit, depending on frame size. And then this is something that I've done for the first time, so we'll just have to see how it goes. But when I started out finishing cattle and you know seeing what, what some of our animals grade, I had really no clue in terms of what was what in terms of USDA grading. Um, so I figured it might be good for some people that are, are kind of new to this to, to maybe see what that kind of means. And so what I'm doing here is just giving you my estimates, trying to convert USDA grades to kind of typical academic grades, so A, B, C, D, um, et cetera. So that said, here, here, this is the best I can do, so we'll see how this goes. So standard, which basically means there's no marbling, I would, I would give that a D. 
And you might say, well, if it has no marbly, why do we even give, give that a passing grade? I'm assuming here that, that, that these farmers are, are millennials. So, you know, if they show up, we've got to give them at least a passing grade. Low select is a C, average select B minus, high select B plus, low choice, a solid A, and then average choice, that's our A plus. Um, I personally have not seen anything above average choice. I'm, I'm sure we, we've gotten, or I'm sure other people have, have gotten some above that. That's the highest I've seen is average choice. What do we look for or what are we trying to strive for? Again, that high select, low choice. Um, if we can get the bulk of our animals in, in that kind of marbling grade point, you know, our, our customers are gonna be happy. One quick note on this though, when I give those USDA scores, I mean, this was actually graded by the USDA grader and not a butcher's estimate because I've actually, again, I've never seen a prime um, animal on grass and the, and I've had a few people tell me that they've achieved that. But when I kind of asked a few questions, dug into that a little deeper in every single case for those people that said they had prime, it was the butcher that told them that. So for what it's worth, I'm, you know, I know there's some butchers that are good at estimating grades out there, but I also know that, that just human nature is what? Uh, we're gonna tend to tell people that they're doing a good job, right? So don't know for sure. All right, so this is kind of the heart of, of my presentation. And, and we're gonna talk, I actually had 10 grass finishing myths. You, you will have them on your handout, uh, but just for time's sake, we're gonna do the, the first six. If we have any time left over, we'll go through the others. So myth number one, and that's you really can't, cattle really can't marble well on pasture. So I'm gonna show you a picture and I'm gonna ask you, do you think this is grain fed steer or steers or grass fed steers? And if I, if I told you this actually is from grass fed steers, would you then believe me that cattle will marble fairly well in pasture? Uh, th this is from three steers that we took in in June. Uh, it turned out they all graded middle choice. That's the first time we ever had that happen. It also, coincidentally, they're all over 30 months. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that's probably why we got all mid choices. We took them over 30 months. And we've, we've started doing that with a few animals the last two or three years. And I have no problem doing that with, with more of them now. Carcass grades. Um, so what I'm going to show you here is the U.S. average, 10-year average, and, and I did this a few years ago, so the data is from 2006 to 2015, but this would be for all U.S. feedlots in this database, so probably the big feedlots uh, that USDA grades for. Out of all those animals in those feedlots, 4% graded prime, 64% graded choice, 32% graded select. And what you're going to see now is, is the average on our farm in terms of marbling. And I threw out the first two years just because the first two years we had just unnaturally high clover content. And, and actually after the first two animals that we took in that one June, probably 80% of our animals from that point forward in those two years graded choice. So I'm throwing those out uh, because we probably can't duplicate that. But on those three years that I would say are probably typical, we, we had over half our, our animals that graded low choice. So can you get decent marbling on, on cattle? Yes. Um, I, I will admit, you know, we're taking a lot longer on doing it on pasture than they're going to do it in a feedlot. But yeah, you can get good marbling. You just got to be patient. And that brings us to this point right here. And this, out of everything I talk about, probably the most important fundamental um, point that I'm, I'm going to go over is this right here. If, if, in other words, if there's nothing else you remember from my presentation, I would like you to remember this one. The key to marbling on pasture is this. You've got to learn to work at nature's pace. Not your pace, not a feedlot pace. You've got to be willing to work with, with how nature designed those animals to grow on, on an all forage diet. What is that? Uh, my experience, it's going to be 25 to 30 months. Again, when I mean mar good marbling, that high select, low choice, 25 to 30 months on perennial pasture. Annual pasture, you can do it quicker. I'm going to assume for in most situations when I'm talking, we're, we're talking perennial pasture. We'll talk about annuals on Thursday. Now that would have been probably two years ago. Now I, I actually have no problem going beyond 30 months, not with all the animals, but with at least a, a portion of them. There's good reasons to do that. So I will go all the way out to three years now, 36 months. And, I, and that does not seem to be an issue at all. Myth number two, you can't fin finish cattle on fescue-based pastures. Now I know we have a lot of 
people on here from other states that probably don't have fescue. Uh, so this won't be as relevant for, for them, but in Upper South, this is a major issue or a major question. Um, and so let me first state that, you know, I will be the first to admit that, that tall fescue Kentucky 31 is, is not an ideal forage to finish cattle on. Uh, but if you learn to, to work around its limitations, if you learn how to get other species in there to get a diversity in your pastures, you can, you can work around it. We've been doing it. Here's a map of the fescue belt. So the line I'm, I'm pointing to right there is kind of the outer edge of that, that main fescue belt. And you get fescue outside of that, it diminishes. But inside of that, pretty much any pasture, I would, I would be willing to bet if you kind of, you know, regardless of what species are in there now, if, if you just kind of use typical management 50 years from now, you're probably gonna have a lot of fescue in that pasture. Um, where are we in that belt? We're in central Kentucky, right about there. So we're not exactly in the heart of that fescue belt, but we're all close. So yeah, we have a lot of fescue in, in our pastures, and we've le but we've learned to live with it. And I'll show you how, how we've kind of done that um, just a little bit now, but more so on Thursday. This is just an example of, of one way you can kind of um, get more forage diversity in your fescue-based pasture. So this is in mid-July. It, it's actually on one of the rented pastures that, that we have. Uh, the fescue is, is headed out, long goats turning brown. That nice green color you see growing up in the understory, that, that is annual lesbidiza. And that's one of the tools that, that we use uh, to, to make sure that they're getting a, a lot of intake from other species and not just fescue. In this particular pi picture, and this is one of our better stands we've had, there's well over 50% of that um, dry matter is, is annual lesbidiza. So <clears throat> this, is, this is not a scientific rule here, but just in general, I would say, you know, no more than, than half their diet can be fescue if you're gonna finish them well. And, and preferably a, a lot less than that. So again, not a hard and fast rule, but just a more general one that I'm, I'm guessing on here. The key to doing that though, is you need a mix of other species. That, you know, if you have a 90% stand of fescue, you don't wanna try finishing cattle on that. Um, it's gonna be a disaster. You don't wanna raise stock or cattle on there. You may not even wanna have a cow calf herd on 90% on infected fescue. So you, you need to learn how to get other species in there and manage for other species. And the other important part of that is regardless of what you have in there, you need excellent grazing management. And that's the key. Um, John Fike will talk about grazing management later today. Ed Rayburn, will, I think we'll talk a little bit about it tomorrow. Um, so we're going to kind of uh, hit you with that a number of different times. So here's an example of what I, one of many examples of what could be what I'm considering the fescue mix. So we have about, you know, not quite, but close to 50% of the stand is fescue. We've got a decent, not great clover stand, 20% in clover, 10% in other cool season grasses, 10% in warm season grass. So these would be warm season grass that would be tip, in a typical perennial pasture. So in Kentucky, that would be Johnson grass, crabgrass most likely, 5% um, annual espadiza. So this would not be a, a pasture like you saw a picture of that we're targeting and seeding down heavily, but, but over time, most of our pastures will have some annual lesbides in them. And then 10% Forbes weeds. So if I have this pasture, I can definitely finish cattle on it. Won't, won't be a problem. It's, it's all in the management at this point, but you still gotta do a good job of management. Myth number three, that you need a special forage chain to finish cattle. Now, some people may not understand what I mean by forage chain, so I'm gonna going to show you an example here. So basically what it is is we have we kind of have different forages staggered through the different seasons so that we're always getting the best gains and, and we're, we're pushing those cattle and, and so we can also finish them kind of throughout the year. So in this example, uh, late winter, early spring, we're on a cool season annual, in this case rye. Uh, May, June in Kentucky, we're on our base pastures when we're getting really good gains. Um, July through September, so summer, early, early fall, we're on warm season annuals. Uh, back going into the fall, we're, we're on our base pastures again. Uh, December, January, we're, we're on cool season annuals again. And then maybe one or two months, we're on stored forages. So yeah, I mean, if, if, if you have this kind of system, you're gonna be able to finish kale easier than just kind of base perennial pastures. Um, there's no question about that. But, but the question really you need to ask yourself is do you need this system and is it going to be cost effective given what you need in terms of that finished beef? 
And the answer is it's going to depend. It's going to depend heavily on, on the size of the farm and, and whether or not you need fresh meat or not. So as an example, if, if you really need year-round production, then a forage chain may be what you want to do or, or some version of it. Maybe not that elaborate, but, but something a little bit smaller. Um, but from what I can tell, just from my experience with marketing and talking to others, about the only reason you would need year-round production, in other words, finished animals throughout the year, is if you're selling a good portion of your anim animals to restaurants. So a lot of restaurants will, will require fresh meat. In other words, they, they don't want frozen. They won't take frozen. It's got to be fresh. So in that situation, you, you would potentially need it. Now, if you're a small farm, you need to kind of balance out, is that, worth it? Is that market worth it for that cost that's going to give to you? Uh, but for typical, word, typical um, grass finished producers where you can get by with seasonal production, you just don't need it. So, and you may be selling year round. So you might be selling at a farmer's market, you know, every week of, of the year. But as long as you can have frozen product, which is pretty much the standard at farmer's markets, um, you know, if you buy yourself a few freezers, that'll be a whole lot cheaper than, than having that forage chain every year, especially for smaller farms. Um, and so I'll mention that point one more. So if you have a giant farm, so if you're in South America in the Pampas and, you know, have a, a 2,000, 3,000 acre ranch, um, you can have a forage chain and you can do it very efficiently. You know, you might be seeding 100, 200 acres at a time. You can afford to have a tractor dedicated and hooked up to a 15 foot no-till drill year round. Um, and, and that will pay off for you. You obviously can't do that on a 100 acre farm here in Kentucky. Um, so yeah, you can go run a drill and I'm not gonna go through the details on all those costs, but to me, running a drill, the biggest cost is not the actual cost to, at the farm store, it's the time investment I'm gonna have in that. And you know, I don't know what everyone else is, is like, but if, if I get back, if by the time I leave my driveway and, and get back, if, it, if it's under an hour, because you you're gonna be at the farm store for a while, hook up, et cetera, you know, you're gonna be monkeying around there uh, you're going to have to calibrate that drill. It doesn't matter if you're seeding five acres or 500. It's going to take the same amount of time to calibrate that drill. So to me, the biggest time in, in running a drill, I'm sorry, the biggest cost in running a drill is the time I have invested in it. So if, if I'm going to run a drill, I need to put a lot of acres through that, not five or 10 at a time. Myth number four, that you need special genetics. And, and I'm not saying genetics aren't important. They, they are, they're very important. But my contention is there probably are a lot more people out there that are getting into grass finishing beef that, that already have genetics that will work. They just don't realize they're, they're gonna work. And so my contention is if you have a cow herd or if you're getting your calves from a cow herd that is th thriving on nothing but forages, so grass, hay, haylage, um, and they're breeding back every year just fine, chances are that, that the calves that come off those cows are gonna finish very well in pasture. Obviously, part of that is the bull, so you have to have a decent bull in that equation. Um, an, another way of saying this is, let's say that that cow, that cow herd was developed from heifers that bred the first time, calved the first time, and then bred back a second time on nothing but forages, in other words, with no supplementation. And, and if that cow herd developed from heifers that went through that protocol, that is natural selection at its best. You are going to have calves that, that will finish well on pasture. Now, if you have a cow herd or you're getting your calves from a cow herd that requires supplementation to get through the winter time, that's a different situation. You may want to change genetics in that situation. Uh, another thing I just want to point out quickly, so you've seen this table. So during that three-year time period, 2014 to 16, all the calves that we finished during that time period were just run-of-the-mill genetics. We either got them from uh, the sale barn or we got them from local farms that if we had not bought them would have gone to the sale barn. So they were not grass finishing genetics at all. They were just kind of typical genetics and we still were able to get that kind of marbling on them. So um, again, I'm not saying genetics are not important. They are, but unfortunately an issue I often see is people think that genetics are, are the bulk of the answer for finishing cattle on, on pasture and, and they aren't. They're part of that equation uh, but I would even argue they're probably not the most important part of it. So to me, grazing management and your overall production system are probably more important than, or at least as important as genetics. So if you're concentrating on genetics, 
to the detriment of your grazing management and, and coming up with an overall production system. We'll cover this, the production systems on Thursday, but if you're ignoring those to the detriment of spending too much time on genetics, it's gonna be, you're gonna have a hard time finishing cattle well. Now, again, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on genetics, but to me, this is the ideal cow to have in your herd for finishing uh, cattle on grass. Uh, she's a, about a five, five and a half frame score, um, not real large lengthwise, I mean, decently large, but real thick. She's, she's, she's a heavy, this is her first calf that she had, so she's really heavy at this point. Um, a lot of people would say she's too heavy for grass finishing, um, and this is actually for my cow herd, which is a county away, but it's, it stays with a friend of mine. He runs them with his herd, but, but we fight over her calves in terms of who's going to get, especially the heifers. When she has a heifer calf, we're fighting over who is going to get that heifer calf to put in their herd. Myth number five, and this is related to genetics, but that's that you need small frame cattle. So if you have small frame cattle already, I'm not saying that you shouldn't. You, you pre small frame cattle will work very well, but, but the point I want to make here is medium frame, even medium large frame cattle from, from our experience with proper grazing management will marble very well. So again, I'm not saying don't, you shouldn't have smaller frame cattle. I'm just saying that you, you might be surprised with how well you can do with a, a frame five, frame six type animal in terms of grass finishing. This is actually the first really small uh, steer that we finished. He probably was around a, a frame three. We actually bought him at a discount because he was he was classified as a short uh, and finished beautifully. You know, he he was a little tank. He had he was great marble or great muscle mass on him. We had a good yield. Uh, he actually did not grade extremely well. He was he was high select. Um, but anyways, so but I'm sure that that was just luck of the draw. I, we fully expected him to to be uh, low choice or even high. So again, not saying you shouldn't have small frame cattle. It's just a lot of folks probably have a cow herd and genetics that they can work with without radically changing them. Myth number six. And this, this is my favorite myth and it's probably the most costly myth. And, and that's that we can finish cattle on grass in, in 18 to 22 months. So to help kind of calibrate ourselves on, on this, let's just do some simple math. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna assume that we wanna finish this steer at 1,250 pounds. We're gonna wean this steer eight months and we're gonna assume it's, it's about 550 pounds at weaning. And so what you're gonna see now is, is on the left, that's how many, the, the age of the animal at harvest. And then what I'm gonna fill in on the right hand side in, in just a second is essentially the average gain that you'd have to have daily gain uh, to finish that animal in that time period. So let's start with 18 months. So our average gain from weaning to harvest would have to be 2.3 pounds per day to, to finish in 18 months. Now that would be the average throughout the year. So that, that doesn't just mean the grazing season, that also means the wintering period. So I've already done the math, but in this example, if they gain 2.7 pounds during the grazing season, and I define that here in Kentucky as April through end of November, they would have to gain 1.5 pounds during the wintering season. It, is that possible? Uh, I've learned never to, never to say it's never gonna happen, but I would be highly skeptical. Um, 2.7 pounds average from April to the end of November, you know, getting those kind of gains early in the grazing season is, is doable, getting those kind of, of gains throughout an um, eight month period is, is, is pretty heroic, as is a, a gain during the winter of 1.5 pounds. Let's drop down to 22 months, the, the upper end of that range that we're talking about. So this looks more doable. Average gain from weaning to harvest is 1.6 pounds a day. But again, that isn't just during the grazing season, that includes a wintering period. So let's look at an example there. So if we gain two pounds a day during the grazing season, we would have to gain 1.1 pounds during the winter period. Is that doable? It's a whole lot more doable than the 18 months. Is it practical for most folks on perennial pasture? I would argue no, but let's, let's see with maybe what I mean here. So let's just talk about the winter gain. So we'd we would have to gain 1.1 pounds a day during the winter to do that. 
I'm going to show you an example of real, real world gains. This is from someone that is a really good cattleman. He's been in the business for at least four decades. He's just started grass finishing, he and his wife, for the last couple of years. Uh, but what he did last winter for at least part of their steers is they just have a lot going on at the farm because of finishing. So they, they decided to contract out um, the wintering of, of this group of steers. And they did it to someone with someone they know. I actually know the, the farm that they went to. And it was all done on a, on a, per, on a per pound of gain base. So in other words, it, the more pounds that those, those cattle gained over the winter, the more that that, that farmer got paid for um, wintering them. So in other words, he had every incentive to, to put on as much gain as he could and, and not just rough them through the winter. And by the way, they were on high quality haylage. And I put that in parentheses because high quality means different things, different people. Uh, and then winter annuals. I'm, I'm assuming the winter annuals were more of a supplement. They were probably eating mostly haylage and then kind of strip grazing through the winter annuals. I'm, I'm guessing on that. But in this kind of wintering system, I would assume that we're going to have pretty good gains. And if we're going to, in other words, if we're going to get that 1.1 pounds, it's going to be in, in some kind of system like this. What did they end up getting? 0.6 pounds per day over, over the winter time. They were shocked. I mean, they were expecting to get one pound or, or maybe better. Both parties were shocked, I should say. So I'm sure if they do this again, they're going to change the, the contract in terms of how they get paid. Uh, but and yes, there's a chance that this was just kind of luck of the draw that winter and, and that maybe, you know, it wasn't being managed properly. But the, the point I want to get to is getting a pound a day over the winter time is, is not that easy. Most people don't realize um, how slow cattle generally gain in the winter time when they're on an all forage diet. So is it possible? Again, I'm not going to say it's not possible, but I would, I would say based on my experience on perennial pasture for, for most folks, they're, they're not going to be able to do that very easily. What is realistic in terms of what I've seen in, in that range? So from 24 to 28 months. Um, and on Thursday, we'll go into more details in terms of exactly what are some systems to, to hit those and, and, you know, when you'd calve, when you'd finish, et cetera. That brings us to, to what I'm calling paper farming. Uh, and this is my favorite quote from Dwight Eisenhower. And by the way, he grew up on a farm and, and I think the last 15 years of his life, he returned to and lived on a farm. Um, but he said, farming looks mighty easy when your plow is a pencil and you're a thousand miles away from a cornfield. That says it all because it's, it's too easy to tell people what they should be able to do and how they can do it. It's a lot harder to actually do it. And that, that gets us to paper finishing, which basically is paper farming you know, with, with finishing animals. So just in my experience, people that, that kind of give maybe overly optimistic estimates of, of what we can do with cattle on grass, not just for a couple months, but for, you know, a year and a half after they've been weaned. Number one, we, we don't often think about compensatory gains. So in other words, if, if we're having to push them hard through the winter, like the example I was telling you, trying to get good gains, that next spring and early summer, it's going to be that much harder to get those really high gains that we would normally expect because we're not going to have compensatory gain on our side. The other thing that I think a lot of people don't think about that aren't actually finishing cattle is these are going to be non-implanted cattle. Most of the gains that we see out there in terms of what various forages should be able to do are almost always going to be with implanted cattle. Um, so what is that, you know, probably around 15% increase in gains is typically, I think, what they say we should, you should be able to get with implanted cattle. So we, we've got to account for that. And then the last factor is what I would call best versus average gains. And, and basically the way I'd summarize this is if we're more likely to see the really good gains on certain forages out there than we're likely to see the, the poor gains. In other words, the better gains and that we haven't studied, the more likely that, that people are going to show results from that particular study. So for all these reasons, just from my past experience over the last 10 years, most people are overly optimistic in terms of how those cattle are going to gain for a year and a half after they've been weaned or whatever it may take. Here's my kind of summary experience for finishing cattle under 24 months. So in the Upper South on fescue, uh, I've never seen it done. And again, by that I mean high consistently high select low choice. I've, I've not seen it done. I've never met anyone that can do it. In the upper south and farms without fescue, I still haven't seen it. And I, and I haven't seen that many farms have completely eradicated fescue, but I've, but I've been on a few and I've talked to a few people that have that situation. 
yeah, they can finish their cattle a little quicker, but it sounds like maybe one to two months, not getting down in that 18 to 22 month range. Other regions, now I will admit I don't get every, I, you know, I'm not, I've not seen all the different regions and, and seen how they're finishing cattle. Um, I will say this though, the, the few situations where I've been able to follow up with, with people that have claimed they finished in 18, 20, 22 months in other regions, Idaho, other areas, in every, and it's not been a lot, but in those situations where I've been able to follow up, either in person, email, or phone, um, and, and dug into details in every situation, their stories didn't completely mesh. And, and in other words, they, they were not finishing as quickly as they were advertising that they were finishing. But I'm not saying it doesn't get done. I just, my, from my experience, I have not seen it done consistently. And one last quick thing, but again, when I'm getting these numbers, I mean on perennial pastures. So I have seen a few situations on, on farms that had pretty much all annuals uh, where they were able to finish in that 18 to 22 month range, mostly 20 to 22 months. Um, I think all of them were in the deep south. Um, and what they're relying on are winter annuals. You know, they have a, a a very mild winter, perfect for growing winter annuals. So they're getting extremely good gains and, and a lot of growth on those winter annuals. And they're also double cropping on, on summer annuals. So why does this myth persist? And I've been wondering this for a long time and, and I've, I've got my own ideas. I wish this was live. I would see what some other people think about this, but I've got two explanations for this. Um, one is straightforward, one isn't quite as straightforward. So the straightforward one is that just most cattle that are finished on grass probably are harvested in that 18 to 22 month range. Now, that doesn't mean they have any marbling. In most cases, they probably have next to no marbling. But just the fact that, that most cattle probably are harvested in that range. And so when we hear someone that, you know, is harvesting in 22, 20 to 22 months, we don't know exactly how well they're finished. We're just assuming that those are well-finished animals potentially, especially when we've been told that you can finish in 18 to 22 months. The second reason is, is a lot less straightforward and it deals with human nature and psychology. So I thought about this and, and the, the best way I can probably explain it is actually to use an example that's not related to cattle, it's related to grain farming because sometimes it's easier to see kind of the, the problems when, when it's not directly related to us. So in my extension duties, I also cover grain. And so I, I, I get to know grain farmers fairly well. And just for context, the average Kentucky corn yield on an average year is probably in the 160 to 170 bushel range. Um, so statistically, there should be at least as many farmers, maybe more that, that say get 140 bushels per acre average yield as there are that get 200 bushels per acre average yield. But all I can tell you is I have never met a 140 bushel per acre corn farmer in Kentucky. Um, even though, in fact, I've, I've met a few 160 bushel per acre corn farmers in Kentucky, even though we know that there should be lots and lots of them out there. So why is that? Why is everyone a 200 bushel corn uh, grower in Kentucky when the average is a whole lot less than that? Again, I think it's human nature and psychology. So. If you're that 140 bushel per acre corn grower and everyone else is telling you they're 200 bushels, are you gonna tell people that you're a 140 bushel per acre corn grower? Um, human nature says, no, you're gonna kind of keep quiet. And I'm guessing we have the same problem with, with grass finishing cattle. Um, when everyone is saying that you should be able to finish cattle in 18 to 22 months and it's taking you 26, 28 months or potentially longer, are you going to want to let people know about that? Um, I wouldn't if, if, you know, if I really thought the average was 18 to 22 months, uh, I'm going to keep quiet. That's just human nature. Um, so anyways, that, that's my theory on it. And as a re result, the myth persists. Um, John, how are we doing on time? We're, we're probably about end of 45 minutes, aren't we? Well, to tell you the truth, I was letting Gabe monitor that. Um, we do have several questions for you in the Q&A uh, that might be good for you to uh, address, Greg. So why don't I stop with the miss? Because I'm, I'm pretty sure that we're close to 45 minutes and I'm going to spend just about one and a half minutes when we're done with the questions, just going over the, the uh, summarizing the rest of the presentations for the three weeks, just to kind of give context for what we're doing. So do you think now is a good time to answer those questions or go through 
the next three nights very quickly? Well, uh, six of one, half dozen the other. Why don't you go ahead and answer questions? Okay, we'll answer questions. So I cannot see the questions. Gabe? You, yeah, I, I can, answer, I can uh, read them to you. Greg, is, you ready for them? I'm ready. All right, so the first question, um, or a couple questions were just related to your first experience or your, your five years of data on those CAS at the beginning of your presentation. Um, they wanted to know, was live weight before shrink or after shrink? When you display that on the table. Yes. So, and this goes into a broader question. The direct answer is those were live weights at the, at the processor. And every processor is going to be different between, so some processors, processor will weigh those cattle when they, when they come off the truck. Some will, will weigh them, you know, before they come in the, the kill floor, et cetera. So, um, and then some people will weigh their cattle, you know, on the farm. None of those weights were, were on the farm. But so I guess what I'm saying is weights on the same animal can easily vary 50 to 75 pounds just between where they weighed on the farm before you send them the process or where they weighed when they got off the truck where they weighed, you know, two hours or four hours later before they went onto the kill floor. So to answer your question directly, those were weighed at the processor. I think they weigh them when they get off the truck. It, it, and most of those were with one processor, but I put a lot less emphasis anymore on live weights just because of that variance. And, and I, I strip, or I, I rely mostly on, on carcass weight. So if you tell me your carcass weights, that's going to give me a lot better information than if, if you tell me, your live weights. All right, thank you. Um, another question related to that table, were the 45 head steers or mixes a mix of steers and heifers? Those, those were all steers. And, and that's one reason I, I didn't show the next two years. Um, the next two years we had a mix of steers and heifers. And then we also had a lot of, the bulk of the animals we had the next two years were coming from our own genetics on two different farms. Uh, we're mostly from first and second calf heifers. So. Our, our live weights and, and carcass weights went down considerably those two years and probably a little bit of our mismanagement, I'm guessing. Um, so, I, so I purposely put the, those first years in because I think those are more representative of our long range um, averages. All right, and then I would say just one more question. The other questions are largely related to forages at this point. So um, just one more question was, doesn't the butcher have to remove the bone if the cattle are over 30 months because of mad cow. Yes, and, and one of my myths was the 30 month rule. And, and again, we didn't have time to get that, but, but the answer to the question is yes, they've got to remove the spinal column. I don't know exactly what that means, obviously the spine and maybe, you know, how far outside the spine does, are they considering the spinal column? But basically what that means is most of your steaks will, will be boneless. So for some customers that may be a problem, in our experience, it, it has not been a problem. We just have to explain that ahead of time. And, and most of our, our animals are still under 30 months. So usually if someone you know, definitely wants bone or bone-in steaks, we can match them up. But there, and I'll talk more about this on Thursday, but there are really, we'll never want all our animals over 30 months, but there's some very good reasons to at least take a, a, a percentage of your animals over 30 months to, to better fit the forage curve um, in terms of production. That's probably good for now, Greg. There's other forage questions we can get to okay. after John's presentation. Uh, there were a few comments that people want to hear about myth number seven. So uh, if you want to just keep that in mind, if we've got time for it. Okay. Um, how about maybe after John presents, if, if we have additional time, I could go through those. I don't want to cut into his time at all. Very quickly, let me just, I meant to, yeah. What I'm gonna do here is just in 30 seconds kind of go over the, the rest of this workshop. So John Fike from Virginia Tech is, is gonna speak as soon as I get off here about forages and grazing management. And so on Wednesday, seven o'clock, Ed Rayburn from West Virginia University is, is gonna cover cattle selection, a little bit on supplementation, winter management. He's also gonna cover a few miscellaneous topics, a little bit of grazing management um, and some other good information. Uh, the second presentation tomorrow evening will be from Kenny Burdine at the University of Kentucky. He's actually my partner on the farm. Um, so he's going to be our marketing ex expert and I'm going to, I might help him just a little bit at the end with questions. Um, Thursday evening, 
we're going to have a producer panel and someone asked me a question by email be, before this, you know, what states are going to be represented. So originally we were going to do this live in Virginia. That was going to be the first state. So our producer panel is composed strictly, I'm pretty sure of, of Virginia producers. Um, so that that's just the way it worked out. So it obviously won't be representative of the whole country. It will be representative of, of kind of the upper South mountain area. We do have one from North Carolina, but again, it will be more mountain region. Yeah, and, and so very similar type area. Um, and, and then I'm going to finish up with w w the, the full name I couldn't fit on here, but basically putting it all together. So the way I describe this is we have a lot of, we're going to go over a lot of instruments. So think of, of um, you know, individual musical instruments and think of a symphony. So we have the instruments, but at some point we've got to put them all together to, to make our music. So essentially what I'm going to try to do Thursday evening is kind of put all the information that we're, we're getting uh, into, into kind of a coherent system to finish those cattle. Cause in the end you can have the greatest forage in the world. If you, you know, if you do have poor genetics, something you know, from animals that, that need supplement or cows that need supplementation, it's not going to work. It's there. You've got to put everything together to make that work. Um, so that said, I'm going to turn it over to John. He's going to talk a little bit more about our sponsors and, and a little bit more um, on those deals that, that On Pasture and Stockman Grass Farmer have for you. So I'm going to stop sharing. John Fike is going to 